So hi guys, my name is Mansi Anand, and I welcome you to this series called RBI Two Four Seven. So guys, in this series, we try to discuss some concepts which can be of use to you if you are preparing for any competitive exam, right? So uh, mo as most of you would be knowing that in this series we do a five question series and before moving to question number one I would like to ask you guys to subscribe to our channel. So guys, if you are a new entrant here and you're watching our video for the very first time, then you can go to this button and subscribe to us and get associated with us. And don't forget to press this bell icon which is flashing on the screen. It can help you to stay in touch with us and get updated regarding every notification that comes up. Right? After that, you can also join our Telegram group. On this group, you can post all your doubts and queries and we'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. So, I hope you're ready for question number one. Okay. So, here is the question number one. Which says, out of the following statements about FCRA amendment bill, select the ones which are not a part of these amendments. So, three statements given to you about the FCRA amendment bill, right? And here are five options. You have to select the correct option and you have to select the options which are not a part of these amendment, amendments. So, be a little bit careful, guys. Moving ahead to the solution. Here is the solution and the solution says the correct option is C. So C means only 3 is not the part, rest 2 are part of the amendments. So let us, anal uh, let us analyze the statements one by one. So guys, this amendment bill, it focuses on the funding that NGOs or non-governmental organizations, they receive from foreign countries. So there are many NGOs that work for social welfare or for advancement of many interests, right? So they receive funding from foreign countries. Now government wants to keep a track record of it or they want to analyze that where is this money coming from and where is this money going to. For that, they have come up with these amendments, right? So first amendment, first uh, proposal under this amendment, it says that to prohibit any grant from abroad being made to organizations that involve public servants. That means any person associated with government or a government or employee, public servants, they should not receive such money. Or in other words, any organization that is controlled or owned by government, they should not get any grants of this kind. Right? So, these grants can be made to the private entities. After that prohibition, uh, prohibiting the transfer of grants received under FCRA to any other person or organization. So, they are saying if there is an NGO, let's say that works for the education of underprivileged children and it receives funding from a foreign organization, let's say some foreign company, then they do not have to transfer this money. They cannot transfer that money to any other person or organizations. They have to use that money themselves, right? After that, to lower the cap on administrative expenses that can be funded by FCRA funds from 50% to 20%. So see, earlier, so we just talked about an, an NGO that works for underprivileged children. Now this NGO, when it receives the money, it can make many payments out of it or it can spend that money on a number of activities, right? Now they are saying if this money received, it is spent on administrative expenses, like if they want to pay salaries of their staff or if they want to pay the rent of their office. So such administrative expenses they can use the funding for paying such expenses, but only to the extent of 20%. This earlier used to be 50%. So let's say the NGO receives a funding of 1 crore. So out of this 1 crore, they can only use 20%. That is 20 lakh for administrative purposes or for fulfilling administrative expenses. Right? After that, to expand the power of Ministry of Home Affairs government to cancel FCRA certificate for more than 
180 days. So if government wants, they can cancel the certificate of that organization or that NGO for more than 180 days or for more than six months if they want to. So this bill, it gives power to government. After that, to make Aadhaar mandatory for persons who control recipient organizations. So making Aadhaar card mandatory for persons. So any person that works in uh, who works in such NGO, they have to carry Aadhaar card. They should have their uh, identification. After that, to stipulate that foreign grants can only be received at State Bank of India at New Delhi. So all such entities who are receiving foreign investments, all such NGOs, they have to open an account with SBI at New Delhi. So this NGO could be located in a remote area in Jharkhand or Odisha, but they will have to open an account at SBI if they want to receive such grants from foreign countries, right? So these are the proposals. Now going back to the question, you can say you can see here. So the first statement is absolutely correct. The second statement is absolutely correct. After that, the third statement is not correct because this bank is Bank of but uh, sorry, this bank is SBI, which is written as Punjab National Bank, right? So now this is the correct statement. So I hope you understand the question. So guys, uh, there is uh, there are there is criticism that government is receiving for this bill from many sections of the society. Many are saying that this has been done in order to have control over the NGOs who protest um, uh, in who protest against the decisions of government. So we are not here to analyze that. We are just talking about the facts, right? So I'm telling you this because we should know about this also, right? So see, uh, like this rule under which the limit to use these fund this funding for administrative expenses has been reduced. This is receiving much criticism because this is going to create trouble for such entities who want to fulfill their expenses and this point also where it is prohibited to transfer such grants to any other organization of person or person because usually what happens is there is a large NGO and they help out smaller organizations which are working for the same cause or some related cause right so they do transfer funds to other organizations but now this bill is prohibiting that transfer. So that is going to create a lot of problems for smaller NGOs who receive funding from larger organizations, right? So moving ahead, uh, before moving ahead, guys, uh, you must be noticing that there is, uh, there, uh, we haven't talked about the full form of FCRN. I'm leaving it to you. You have to explore it and mention it in the comments. Moving ahead. So here is your second question and this question says according to defense acquisition procedure 2020 DAP which clause has been dropped from government to government single vendor and intergovernmental agreements five options given to you talks about a very current topic let's see what is the solution and the solution is option E option E means that the clause that is dropped is the offset clause right so guys we'll just uh, in one minute discuss about other clauses so sunset clause is the clause which puts an end to a certain rule in the agreement or in the contract sunrise clause uh, it makes applicable certain provisions of the agreement before uh, to before the time of happening of contract right so it make it is retrospective in nature after that force measure i think we have force this we have discussed in detail in one of our previous sessions confidentiality clause as the name tells you that the provisions provisions or some information in the agreement that should be confidential and not shared with everyone right so moving ahead to learning about offset clause now what is this offset clause offset the word the name uh, it itself tells you that you have to set off something. If you are losing something, then you have to make it up for that loss or you have to compensate, compensate that. Right. So this is the word offset tells you its meaning. Now, in defense, what is the meaning in defense agreements, agreements or contracts which are related to defense? Offset means that 
it is an obligation by an international player to boost india's defense industry if india is buying defense equipment from it so let us try to understand it with the help of an example so let's say india is so let's say india is buying some submarines just a second okay so let's say india is buying sub submarines from japan right so now obviously it is boosting japan's economy or it is contributing to japan's economy because india is importing these goods from japan now what india is saying since we are helping you with your production by boosting your industry by boosting your domestic production then whatever you earn you will have to give it back to us in some form or the other or at least a part of it so offset clause is a clause in such agreements where where the where one party tries to set off the loss that they have incurred by getting something in return right so india might put a condition that okay if we are paying 10000 crore to you for these submarines you have to invest 30% of it or let's say 3000 crores of it into indian economy now japan in different forms it can invest invest 3000 crores in india so india is also receiving some benefit out of this deal so such clauses are offset clause so there is no particular definition but that can be any benefit that the buying country buying country here is india in our example that the buying country is demanding from the selling company or the importing company country is demanding from the exporting country that any benefit comes under the offset clause because they are trying to offset the comp uh, they are trying to offset the loss right so i hope now it is clear to you so policy was adopted on the recommendations of vijay kelkar committee in 2015 and here are some objectives why is an offset clause put into any defense procurement or any defense purchase agreement Com compensating for a significant outflow of a buyer country so if india is buying submarines from japan obviously it is spending money or it is uh, making an outflow from the domestic country and they want a compensation for it so for country's resources in a large purchase of foreign goods so compensation partial compensation after that facilitating induction of technology now sometimes these clauses they work on facilitating of induction of technology so they might put a condition that we want some advanced equipments right so anything they might so the buying country might put any condition that results in induction of technology or bringing of new technology into the importing country after that adding capacities or capabilities of domestic industry now if india is buying from japan and they are telling japan that you invest 3000 crore back into our economy now they are adding to indian capacities this money which would be invested by japan into india right so these are some objectives of cag so why has this offset clause been dropped because cag in its recent report comptroller and auditor general of india they recently said that that this clause this offset clause is a cost for the exporting country that is why that might discourage the deals so if we are putting up high offset conditions or we are demanding too much under the offset clause that might lead to lesser deals right so that 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 can be a factor behind discour behind discouraging of the deals and we want more deals right so that is why they are thinking of dropping the clause here you can see so this clause will be dropped under government to government agreements so if if government of one country is making a deal with government of other country under that under that agreement this offset clause will be dropped or if government of one country is buying something from 
a foreign single vendor so they are not buying from multiple vendors but only from one seller then this offset clause will be dropped and after that if there is an intergovernmental agreement right so government to government agreement they are usually transaction specific whereas this intergovernmental agreements this can be an umbrella agreement under which there can be other smaller agreements right so so in simple words if government of one country is dealing with government of other country then the offset clause will be dropped and if government of one country is buying something from one single seller of foreign country then this offset clause will be dropped but in case there are multiple vendors then they can have offset clause or if the deal is taking between private play the deal is taking place between private players uh, no government involvement then also there can be an offset clause right so i hope now you are clear about this clause and we can move ahead to the next question and here is your third question for today which says what do you think would be the impact of a highly volatile market on the number of initial public uh, initial public offerings issued in the economy so there is an in, there is an economy in which there are highly volatile markets and now you have to tell in such an economy what is going to be the impact on the ipos are they going to be increased are they going to be decreased right so guys uh, now is the time when you pause the video and give all the options a thorough look right until then we'll move ahead to the solution and the solution is option d so option d means lesser companies would like to come up with ipos as they would not attract participation of retail investors as well as the institutional investors so guys very simple logic involved here so the markets are highly volatile right so in highly volatile markets there is going to be uncertainty no one knows what might be the direction of market so that is why it is riskier for the companies to issue shares in such a market because they do not know about the consumer preference right so in a highly volatile market they would not be able to attract retail investors or the institutional investors so first of all institutional investors the activities of retail investors they usually follow these bigger institutional investors right so they won't be able to attract any investors that is why ipos are going to be slowed down or there is going to be a fall in numbers of initial public offering that is going to happen in the economy right so recently you can see in india we have seen so many ipos coming up and they are getting a very good response but some experts were citing that that uh, volatility is increasing in the market that is why till now these ipos uh, are getting good response from past 1 2 months so we cannot say about the future if the volatility continues then it might lead to these ipos getting slowed down right a very simple question moving ahead here you can see while fluctuations it can cast a shadow over upcoming ipos leading to delays in ipo launches lower subscription numbers and muted listed gains so do you remember we talked about listing pop in one of our previous videos so those gains like listing pop they are going to be lower right so multiple ipos in september saw massive subscriptions in india and bumper listing gains right listing pop thanks to copious liquidity and ipo drought since march so there were no companies coming up with ipo since march that is why once they started to come up that there was there was a boost in demand or you can say there there was pented up demand which just which uh, came out all at once so volatility may crimp participation by both retail and high net worth investors moving ahead to the next question so here is the fourth question for today which says mr bahubali is a trader in forest produce who sells some of his timber to mr rana on selling his goods mr bahubali collects a 2.5% tax when making the sale this amount collected by mr b or you can see mr bahubali from his customer so there is a correction
right so this amount collected as a tax by mr bahubali from his customer mr rana is termed as dash here are your five options let's see what the correct option is and the correct option is option a which means it is tcs or tax collected at source so tds and tcs these are very confusing terms and students do get to confused between them them now we are going to discuss the difference between them here you can see tds and tcs see whenever a payment is being made so whenever a, there is a company or there is a person that person is making some payments by companies and individuals on that tax if some proportion is being cut then it will come under tds for example let's say you are working at a company let's say you are working at deloitte and um, deloitte pays you salary right so that salary that deloitte is paying to you is a payment for them and let's say if your salary is 50000 and they deduct a 10% tax that means they are going to deduct rupees 5000 and paying you 45000 then this tax is tds for them or tax deducted at source so whenever they whenever a company or an individual they are making a payment which is really, which is creating an income for the other party or for the receiver and then they cut some tax on it they deduct some tax on it that deduction is known as tax deducted at source so this can be made on a number of payments like salaries as i just gave you example and after that this can be made on rents this can be made on any uh, consultancy fees commission professional fees interest etc right so when does it apply on payments above a specified limit right after that coming to tcs now tcs is a tax that a seller let's change the color okay now there is a seller and the seller sells some goods to a buyer a very simple transaction now this buyer is going to pay money to the seller right and on this money which is which buyer is paying to the seller let's say seller adds a percentage of tax and collects it from the buyer then that tax collected by the seller is going to be known as tcs let's just, just as it was given to you in the example that mr bahubali is selling forest produce to mr rana and on that he is collecting some tax so that is why it will come under the category of t c is that is tax collected at source so if tax is being collected at payment then it is tds and if it is being collected at and if it is being collected by a buyer uh, by a seller from a buyer then it is going to come under tcs right these tcs uh, tcs deductions they are made on sale of goods such as scrap tinder mineral woods etc right on sale of certain goods moving ahead to the next question for today and here is the last question for today which says according to the new rules e-commerce platforms are required to deduct tds at the rate of dash of the gross amount paid to sellers who use their platform for sales on amounts above rupees 5 lakh to the seller considering the payment receiver has an aadhar card right so relates to a new rule let's see what the solution is and the solution is option e so option e means 1% so guys let's try to understand this with the help of an example let's say there is a platform an e-commerce platform and let's take the most famous one that is amazon now amazon provides you with a wide variety of products so do you think all these products are produced by amazon itself no it is buying these products from a certain number of sellers right so there are different sellers
right and after that amazon provides a platform so amazon is nothing but a platform for sellers and after that it connects these sellers to a number of buyers right now since amazon is going to buy goods from this seller so let's say this seller one she sells bed sheets so she deals in bed sheets and it's and she sells her bed sheets to amazon and buyers buy it from here now if amazon is buying let's say 100 bed sheets from her then obviously amazon is going to pay something to her since she is the seller and amazon is the buyer in this case right so now when amazon is making payment to this seller one let's say miss a so amazon is making a payment to miss a for the bed sheets which it has bought from miss a on this amount amazon has to collect some amazon has to collect some tax which is going to be come under which is going to come under this situations right so this tax we are talking about let's say um so let us increase the amount let us increase the number of bed sheets let's say uh, this this bed sheet amazon buys 1000 bed sheets from her right and now each bed sheet is costing rupees 1000 so 1000 rupees for each bed sheet and 1000 bed sheets that makes a total bill of 10 lakh so since this amount is greater than 5 lakh and let us consider that miss a has an aadhar card amazon will have to deduct a 1% tax on this amount but let's say if miss a is not having an aadhar card then amazon would have to deduct a tax of 5% or collect a tax of 5% right so guys do you see here buyer is collecting the tax from the seller right so amazon is making a payment to miss a and on that payment it is from that payment it is uh, deducting some tax amount which this platform would have to pay to government right so that is why it is tedious that it is that is being deducted here you can see so basically this summarizes what we have just discussed in the example uh, ecom players must now comply with section 194o of the income tax act which requires them to make tax deductions at source so guys why is this tedious not tcs we just discussed that amazon being the buyer that buyer making the payment amazon making payment to miss a so the buyer the seller so do you see a payment is being made here that is why we are saying that they have to deduct tax which is tds on amounts above 5 lakhs so let's say if miss a sells goods to amazon which are worth less than 5 lakhs then there is going to be no tds deducted on their online platforms for revenues drawn by hawking of goods and services ecom operator must deduct 1% for merchants if they have pan or aadhar number and 5% for those without either even if the payments are not routed through it so if uh, so if the merchants they do not have the pan card or aadhar card then the tax will be deducted at the rate of 5 percent so deduction is over and above the gst levied on the online sales right after that there is one more tax which has come into play from 1st october so a seller would be required to collect tax from 1st october only if his turnover exceeds rupees 10 crore in the last financial year so now here seller is collecting tax right here seller is collecting here the buyer is collecting tax right so if there is a seller whose sales exceeded 10 crore in the last financial year that seller would have to 
collect TCS and this would be applicable if the receipt of sale consideration from a buyer exceeds 50 lakh in financial year. Two new rules here as you can see that one about the TDS one about the TDS and the other one about TCS. So under this TCS which is going to be valid from October 1 if there is a seller and his turnover exceeds 10 crore in the last financial year and the sales they exceed 50 lakhs in the current financial year to a buyer then this seller would have to deduct a tax of 0.1% as TCS right. So these were the five questions for today and I hope you learned something new from this video and if you did then don't forget to give us a thumbs up because I'll be back in the next session with some new set of information and till then take care of yourself keep your studies going on and we'll meet in the next session. Goodbye. Thank you for being here.